In this video, I'll be showing you how to make braided silk fly fishing lines. Uh, other people might do it differently. Silk tight fly lines can in fact be made from yarns other than silk and it's great fun to experiment with modern yarns. Nylon is okay, filament polyethylene is interesting stuff, uh, but of course natural silk is the best and it's a sustainable material like bamboo. If you're going to muck about with yarns other than silk, consider fibre length, denier and absorbency. There are various different types of silk, some of which do not make good silk fly lines. Barrette is the lowest quality silk yarn and does not make good fly lines. Spun silk is made from the broken cocoon strands. Uh, and spun silk, in my experience, does not make good silk fly lines either. Filament silk, sometimes known as real silk, does make good silk fly lines. Raw silk consists of two proteins, fibrion and sericin. Fibrion is the good stuff for line making. Sericin is a bit like dried PVA glue, stiff and rough and can be washed off the raw silk using hot soapy water. Filament silk tends to be sold in skeins. If you buy silk in skeins, you'll need a skein winder to transfer the silk yarn from the skein onto the braiding machine bobbins. A skein winder looks a bit like an umbrella without the fabric stretched across it. Filament silk can also be bought on combs, already degummed, which tend to cost more than raw silk skeins, but cones of degummed filament silk are very much easier to use. A single 2022 denier thread of silk yarn contains about seven cocoon strands. One 2022 denier silk thread is often referred to as an end. One of my DT5 silk fly lines in the belly contains 16 threads of 12 times 2022 denier filament silk. Once that denier method of silk counting is understood, even quite complex fly line tapers become logical. Silk from the skeins or combs needs to be plied into the correct thickness for making a particular weight of line. Plying is, therefore, an essential skill for silk fly line making. Luckily, it's really easy. Silk from the lower combs passes through the centre of the upper combs. As the thread peels off the combs, it lightly twists together to form a new, thicker thread. A purpose-built plying tower can be bought, but upturned fruit trays work just as well. Correctly wound bobbins are key to a good braid. An electric drill makes a perfectly good bobbin winder for the hobbyist. The bobbins are wound in accordance with the direction indicated by the teeth at the bottom of each bobbin. A consistent pressure with zigzag formation for bobbin winding works best. Horn gears move the carriers around the track of the braiding machine. The carriers hold the bobbins. The carriers also control the tension of the individual threads peeling off the rotating bobbins. Eight carriers travel clockwise around the track and the other eight carriers travel anti-clockwise. Weaving together the thread as they go. The takeoff rollers drag the silk thread up and off the rotating carriers and bobbins. The rate at which the takeoff rollers drag the silk off the bobbins is crucial, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. The braided silk is then passed up and over the top of the braiding machine and into a basket behind. 
silk fly lines are made to be thicker or thinner by increasing or decreasing the silk thread bundle. In other words, to make a thicker silk fly line, the maker uses either thicker silk threads and or introduces additional silk threads by engaging more carriers and bobbins. Understanding the relevance of the braid angle and how to alter that angle is an essential skill for anyone wishing to make a braided silk fly line. Gears at the side of the takeoff rollers determine the rate at which the silk threads are dragged off the rotating bobbins by the takeoff rollers. When the thread is dragged off the rotating bobbins by the takeoff rollers at too fast a rate, the angle of the threads across the emerging braid will be too steep. When the threads are dragged off the rotating bobbins at too slow a rate by the takeoff rollers, the angle of the threads across the emerging braid, the braid or pick angle, will be too shallow. When the silk thread bundle is increased or decreased, the configuration point, the point where all the threads come together to form a braid, will either rise or fall and, consequently, the braid angle will change. When making a silk fly line, a good one anyway, you cannot change the volume of the silk thread bundle without also changing the rate at which the threads are dragged off the rotating bobbins. Note that I'm using the word rate rather than the word speed. Increasing or decreasing the speed of the braiding machine won't change the braid angle. By changing the rate at which thread is dragged off the rotating bobbins, by changing the gears at the side of the takeoff rollers, it is possible to maintain throughout the length of the whole silk fly line the desired 45 degree braid angle. There's a good chapter about this in a book called Specialist Yarn and Fabric Structures and a very good book about braiding generally is Braiding Technology for Textiles. The actual braiding of the silk fly line is worth mentioning about thread tension. So just to recap, the carriers travel around the track of the braiding machine shunted along by horn gears underneath the track and the carriers carry the bobbins of silk. Tension is added to the individual silk threads by the carriers. Each carrier has a weight which keeps each thread under tension. The carrier weights with this type of carrier are kept under tension by two little carrier springs. The carrier springs determine the tension of each individual silk thread. The carrier springs can easily be changed during servicing of the braiding machine. They simply twist on and twist off a bit like twisting a key on and off a key ring. The strength of the carrier springs is denoted by a set of standard colours. If the silk threads are too loose, the braided silk fly line will open up when pushed together and consequently will be useless for fishing with. If the silk threads are too tight, the braided silk fly line might be a bit stiff and there will be little room left within the braid for the drying oils and varnish. With this type of carrier, a nice medium thread tension for silk fly line making purposes is achieved by installing red colour carrier springs. Taper creation. Remember, the thickness of the silk braid is increased or decreased by adding to or taking away from the silk thread bundle. And when the silk thread bundle is increased or decreased, so the braid angle also needs to be adjusted. On a 16 carrier maypole braiding machine like this one, 
set up for diamond pattern braiding. Eight carriers are travelling clockwise around the track and eight carriers are travelling anti-clockwise around the track, weaving in and out of each other as they go. Uh, diamond pattern's my favourite configuration as it's the simplest to understand and it makes this braid with a nice smooth surface. There are a couple of ways to create a tape when braiding a silk fly line. You can either increase or decrease the thread bundle by changing the denier of the silk threads being braided, or you can change the number of threads being braided. In this example, I'm going to show how to create a taper by changing the number of threads being braided. In this picture, you can see that I have set the machine up with just eight engaged carriers. Four engaged carriers travelling clockwise and four engaged carriers travelling anti-clockwise around the track. I would describe the placement of the engaged carriers as opposing. I've marked the top of the engaged carriers with a blue marker pen and further identified those eight engaged carriers by placing green bobbins on them. The carriers which aren't currently in use have their weights held up with wire so that they don't trigger the disengagement arm on the braiding machine. I've also changed the gears at the side of the takeoff rollers so that the takeoff rollers are dragging thread off the rotating bobbins at a very slow rate so as to achieve the desired 45 degree braid angle with the silk bundle being so thin. I've also run off the desired length of thin level line so I'm now ready to increase the thread bundle to start creating the ascending taper. In this picture you'll see that I'm adding in an additional thread by engaging the first available clockwise rotating carrier. The additional silk thread is passed up through the little white braiding former. The thread is then held taut and the manual turning handle at the top of the braiding machine is turned a few times to lock in the additional thread. The unwanted end is trimmed flush with the emerging braid using a razor blade. I then run the machine for a set interval before placing the next additional thread. All the additional threads are on grey coloured plastic bobbins to help me keep track of what I'm doing. In this picture you'll see that I'm adding in a further additional thread by engaging the first available anti-clockwise rotating carrier. After the thread is placed, the loose end trimmed, I again run the machine for a set interval. That process is repeated until all the carriers are engaged. Now that I've increased the thread bundle, as you can see, consequently, the braiding configuration point has dropped down and the braid angle is now much shallower. It is, therefore, now time to change the rate at which the increased thread bundle is dragged off the rotating carriers by changing the cogs at the side of the takeoff rollers. This is a picture of the different sized takeoff roller gears. Uh, these gears are the right size on my machine for the line that I'm braiding. To make different sized fly lines and to create any taper whatsoever properly you need a range of different sized cogs. Uh, in an ideal world you'd have a continuously variable transmission uh, but if you've got different sized cogs for your takeoff rollers that's all that's necessary. After the belly of the line has been braided the descending taper is created in the opposite way to that just described for the ascending taper. Threads are taken away in the same sequence, leaving in place just those engaged carriers 
which were marked up previously with a marker pen and which are carrying the green bobbins remembering to also maintain the desired 45 degree braid angle when a thread is taken away from the thread bundle on the descending taper rather than trimming the loose end off with a razor blade the loose end is instead held down within the maypole using a closed peg which then embeds the loose end neatly within the core of the braid. Once the braiding is all complete the next step is to carefully inspect the line. Inch by inch the braid is checked for any lumps, bumps or loose ends. With a pin and a pair of fine fly tying scissors any issues are teased out and trimmed away so that the braided line is perfect before moving on to impregnate with drying oil. Any issues left unattended at this stage will become magnified once the drying oil has expanded the line and set in place. Impregnation with drying oil. The difficult processes are now complete. Finishing the braided fly line with drying oil and then varnishing is the easy bit. Traditionally silk fly lines are finished with a drying oil. There are various different natural drying oils all with slightly different properties. Here in England boiled linseed oil is readily available and cheap. Boiled linseed oil hasn't actually been boiled. The term instead refers to linseed oil with some additives included that slightly speed up the drying time. The wonderful thing about linseed oil is that once it's dried it remains nice and bendy. The line is placed into a jar of boiled linseed oil and the jar is then placed into a vacuum chamber. I made this vacuum chamber out of the insides of an old fridge freezer. The pressure gauge has long since stopped working but that doesn't matter. As the pressure inside the vacuum increases, air trapped amongst the silk threads of the braid is sucked out. After a while the bubbles stop, indicating that there is no more air trapped within the braid. When the pressure inside the vacuum is released, those voids that were once filled with air are now filled with the linseed oil. The impregnated line is then fished out and allowed to drip dry. Boiled linseed oil has a protracted drying time. At room temperature the impregnated line will take several weeks or even months to dry. Uh, if you're in a rush that drying time can be speeded up with the application of heat. Trout sized silk fly lines at this stage in the process need some delicate treatment. I place trout sized lines into a drying cabinet. All bamboo fly rod makers have a drying cabinet something like this. A simple wooden box or an old cupboard with an old fashioned 100 watt light bulb wired inside as a heat source. Temperature inside the box reaches about 40 to 50 degrees centigrade. The lines stay in the drying cabinet for about a week. Salmon sized lines can withstand more heavy duty treatment and are placed in my kitchen oven at 80 degrees centigrade for about 10 hours. There might be an ultraviolet light element to the, polymer, to the full polymerization of linseed oil, I'm not sure. However, to be certain, the lines are fully cured when they come out of the heated drying, I hang them in a sunny window for a few weeks or until I'm ready to work on them just again, just to be sure. It's important not to move on to the next process until the line is completely dry. To check that the line has fully dried, pull the line firmly between your hands. If little droplets of linseed oil emerge from the line when it's pulled, then clearly the line isn't dry yet. Also a fully dried silk line, fly line by this stage will tend to have no stretch. 
additional coats of boiled linseed oil. I prefer to braid my silk fly lines using diamond configuration. Diamond produces a braid with a fairly smooth surface and because of that often only one impregnation with linseed oil is required in order to fill up the braid level with the outermost silk threads. Regular or Hercules configurations produce braids with a slightly uneven surface and they might require more additional coats in order to fill up the voids. If you're going to apply more drying oil coats I recommend you add a little varnish in with the oil to help strengthen and harden the further layers. Some gentle abrasion might be needed once the linseed oil is fully dried to smooth down the surface of the braid. The cuticle. Once the braided line has been successfully filled with dried linseed oil level with the outermost fibres of the braid then it's time to add a final cuticle. Although dried linseed oil is wonderfully bendy it also has a kind of rubbery feel. No angler wants to fish with a rubber fly line. Also dried linseed oil isn't totally waterproof and if nothing is done about that the line will soon become waterlogged and start to sink. At this stage I impregnate the line again but this time with a solution consisting of 50% yacht varnish and 50% white spirit. The thin, viscous solution under pressure quickly finds the remaining voids within the line and fills those. The further impregnated silk fly line is now spread out in a tray and allowed to dry naturally. Once dry, the yacht varnish provides a thin, hard, waterproof layer which, when polished, will th fly through the rod rings very nicely. Polishing. Uh, a top tip which avoids the need for much otherwise unnecessary abrasion and polishing. When the earlier coats of linseed oil and varnish are just at the point of solidifying, pull the line through your hands to smooth out the coating and if necessary wipe off the excess. Once the cuticle is completely dry, the line can be polished for the final time ready to be fished with. Plastic pan scrubbers are just the right toughness to scrub away the remaining roughness on the silk fly line surface. Homemade fly line grease is used as a polish. A good silk fly line grease can be made from equal quantities of lard, Vaseline and a small knob of beeswax melted together. The mixture also works really well on dry flies and chapped lips. 10 quid's worth of ingredients will make enough line grease to last a lifetime. Any remaining roughness and stiffness after this polishing will disappear during the first half a dozen fishing trips and nothing further should be done to try and accelerate this breaking process. Before using the line it's useful to weigh it so that you know where it falls under the AFTM scale and to measure its length. Silk fly lines need to be dried out naturally after a fishing trip. The best fly line dryer by far is an empty cardboard box. Before the next fishing trip apply a thin layer of line grease so that the line floats. Make a big loop in the end of your backing, big enough to drop your reel through and that uh, allows a double taper fly line to be quickly changed end to end part way through the fishing day. So that's how I make a silk fly line. Maybe others do it differently, who knows. I hope someone somewhere found this video useful. Thanks for watching.